It's time to finish this. The war has been long. We've lost many friends. I long for the days of lush, green fields. Of a time when we weren't surrounded by howling artillery and the putrid, sweet stench of dead flesh. But can we truly win this? So much time has passed for so little gain. Alright, dropping the bit, we're doing to boldly flee. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions red which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So we're wrapping up the Doug Walker trilogy. We're this close to finishing Doug Sember. Just a little bit longer, guys. But I can't deny this next step is gonna be pretty agonizing. Kegasia was a slog, but there's a charm to it that pulls people back in the so bad it's good sort of deal. Suburban Nights was similar, but actually had a few elements that could have worked on their own as an independent movie. Maybe not a spectacular one, but for a low-budget comedy, there was definitely potential. It's just sad that it was handled by people who got drunk off the ironically bad mentality. Because I definitely think that's the prevailing issue with these films. Everyone is astonished at how bad they all are, considering they come from film critics, especially since more than one of these people actually went to film school. Granted, that's not saying much. Yeah, let's be perfectly honest here, 99% of film students wind up being the lighting guys and not Martin Scorsese. But the point is, these movies make fundamental mistakes that even complete amateurs can see are issues. And it comes down to it being part of the joke. Yeah, they intentionally tried to do so bad it's good, and it's clear when you consider their style of video. These are meant to be over-the-top live-action cartoons that go out of their way to not be good on purpose. That does not make them comedic geniuses by any means. In fact, it sort of goes to make the whole experience that much more painful, but it at least explains some things. The cheap special effects and zero attempts to address plot holes are all seen as badges of honor that enhance the movies, even if anybody else can see that it's just nonsense. But that's the first two movies. To Boldly Flee is where things start getting a tad... different. That's right, To Boldly Flee is gonna be an interesting beast, to put it very lightly. It came out in 2012, keeping to the once-a-year anniversary theme that the other Channel Awesome films stuck to. The cast is mostly the same as from Suburban Nights and Kickassia, but once again, you have some new people show up and others who are gone from Channel Awesome. Now, I know some of you guys think I should keep the drama separate from the actual film reviews, discuss the stories and dissect them in their own independent video instead of in these reviews, and the only thing I can really say about that is how in God's name do you separate them? The drama really just fused with Channel Awesome as a whole to the point that it's basically impossible to talk about one without bringing up the other. People to this day can't reference Juorio without talking about his sexual shenanigans. How do you just ignore that and judge the movies objectively? Especially when the entire point of these things were to celebrate the people of Channel Awesome. These weren't made for outsiders, these are for people who are intimately aware of this circle and their impact on the internet. I also feel like clearing up some stuff from the document simply due to how much bullshit's been allowed to spread, and just taken as truth without question. I already discussed the Lord Cat Spoonie deal, you know, where Lord Cat blames Spoonie for driving blistered thumbs into the ground when really it was just based off a stunt he did at E3, which wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, Dr. Gonzo and Holly and the Juwario conspiracy, which that one is probably going to get me shot in a vacant alleyway someday. But there's even more to talk about that just slipped through the radar. Like apparently the only one who confirmed the M. Bison Cape story was Lord Cat, back when he was posting on Kiwi Farms. But he supposedly admitted he was just confirming any rumor that made Doug look like a retard, and didn't actually know if it was true. They took the fucking M. Bison Cape story from us. 
But you also have the Obscurus Lupa story, where she was fired for being 15 minutes late on a Skype call, only for it to come out that it was because she was over two hours late, and might have even had a history of ignoring Mashad whenever he tried to contact her. The Jesu Otaku story, where she was trying to hold something over Mashad's head to avoid being fired, which if you factor in her friendship with Holly, and possible knowledge of Juwario's non-consensual trouser trekking, definitely doesn't point to good things. The sight was so awful and terrible that you were all miserable, yet you fought tooth and nail to stay in it. Now there are people who can back up what they said. Iron Liz is one of the few contributors who actually kept her grievances very grounded and easy to point to, mainly an injury she received on set and being pressured to sign a release to prevent liability. For context, Iron Liz played one of the cloaks that hunted after the critics in Suburban Nights, and during the final battle with Malachite, the action scene fucked her knee up. This is a grounded, believable story of incompetence, not some over-the-top tale of evil that some of the other contributors would try to trick you into believing. And it is sad, because even the Suburban Nights segment has cases of bullshit mixed with it. There's a claim that a woman named Eliza was left duct tape in a cross position for so long she passed out. In truth, she said she felt like she was going to pass out, but never did. So once again, they take a claim with a little bit of meat behind it and stretch things just way too far. And I'm not even saying Iron Liz is the one who claimed that, that's just a thing that was mixed in with the document next to hers. And this is sort of a running theme throughout the whole fucking thing. You have stories that could be true, but because the founders of the document are so scared it wouldn't get the result they wanted, they threw in tons of crap, just so they can, frankly, manipulate people. I said in the beginning of this whole journey, that everyone involved are liars and they should not be trusted. And frankly, I've only hardened my stance on the matter. Yeah, it sucks that real people could have possibly had real grievances, but when there's so many holes in this document, there's nothing to do except write the whole thing off and say try again. Because if you're gonna try and ruin somebody's life, which was the intention behind the Change the Channel document, Dr. Gonzo flat out said he wanted to see Mike Machad homeless and surviving off rats, you need to make sure your shit's in order. Otherwise, you get guys putting out holes in your story and making you all look like hypocritical scumbags. Because another big thing I noticed with all the claims is the complaints that none of them were actual employees. They never signed employment contracts. That sounds really incompetent and unprofessional for a company like Channel Awesome, but when you think about it, it makes sense. No, they weren't employees. They were independent contractors. It's like how a real estate agent might not work for a brokerage as an employee, but as an agent contracted with them. Ironically, it can give you more freedom to just pack up and leave if things piss you off. Which raises the question of, why didn't you? Some did. Some left for greener pastures or took their firings as chances to start things fresh. But a lot stayed on, despite the over-the-top behavior they claim it happened. These people swear that Mike Mashad walks around the office, pink-faced, seething with rage about how much he despises women. But they stayed on for a number of years. That doesn't make any sense. Nobody gave two fists of a fuck who Mike Mashad was, he was just some dude that worked with Doug. They do know who Nostalgia Chick is, and would have taken her side if she decided to call them out beforehand. But she never did. Only when it was convenient, because they had the Me Too movement to profit off of. In true Channel Awesome fashion, these people chased a trend, fell the fuck apart, started backstabbing each other, and went down as forgotten failures. It's actually kind of funny now that I think about it. Frankly, it points to something that's gonna sound very harsh, yet accurate in my eyes. Doug never needed these people. But they needed Doug. As much as we laugh at him now, the guy was a very popular figure back in the day. Multiple stories, from the document itself, claim that a majority of the traction to Channel Awesome and That Guy with the Glasses, which was their dedicated website, came from Doug's videos. You had other figures pop up who became successes in their own way, but part of me can't shake the feeling that this entire saga was just a vendetta out of sheer pettiness. But we'll talk about all this towards the end. For now, to Boldly Fleet. So to Boldly Flee is the third and last official Channel Awesome special, taking place almost immediately after the events of Suburban Nights. As it turns out, there's a growing anomaly in space that seems to be calling out for the nostalgia critic. Not only that, 
but the government and the Hollywood industry are colluding to pass the Sucka Bill, a very blatant parody of the SOPA and other assorted related bullshit copyright laws. Essentially, if you use copyrighted material anywhere on the internet, you get hunted down by the law. It was a bullshit thing that never went through because literally impossible to enforce. Well, at the same time, Turl from Battlefield Earth is hunting down the Nostalgia Critic for revenge after he destroyed his planet during the Battlefield Earth review. At the same time as all of this, Lankara's evil nemesis Mechakara replaces him to get access to Malachite's gauntlet, hungry for its power. You also have Todd in the Shadows dealing with the love triangle between him, Obscure's Lupa, and Lindsay Ellis, and Film Brain and Luke Mockery stumble their way into a secret that could affect reality itself. You also have Spoonie possessed by Mati, Brad Jones becomes a Sith movie producer, oh my fucking god. Okay, so Kickassi and Suburban Knights had some seriously light stories. Suburban Knights had more of a plot than Kigassia, but it was still a pretty simple skeleton to hang jokes and gags off of. To boldly flee is the opposite. It has so much plot that it's actually pretty fucking agonizing. So many different subplots and attempts at arcs that you might honestly start getting confused fast, especially when you can't figure out what's meant to be a one-off joke and what's meant to be a running arc. It doesn't help that the runtime is a fucking beast. Suburban Nights being two hours long is an investment. To Boldly Flee makes that look like an episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. The runtime is over three hours and 28 minutes long. A fucking nostalgia critic movie is longer than the Redux version of Apocalypse Now. Think about this, guys. It's actually almost impressive. A three and a half hour long movie that barely has a budget made by a bunch of randies. Never give up on your dreams, guys. These, these dudes sure didn't. There's so many different story beats and arcs that it's actually hard to figure out a place to start. For one, this movie isn't good. It's exactly as dumb as the other two, but with very mild improvements. They got better cameras so things look clear and sharp this time instead of the, let's face it, Blair Witch level found footage that we had to deal with before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's also a lot more green screen effects. Pretty much every scene has somebody behind a green screen if they're not just in one of the critics' houses. And I mean all the time there's a green screen, from the very beginning to the very end. To their credit, it gives the location some variety, especially since this is supposed to be a science fiction film, but it's still just people in front of a green screen, so there's not really much they can do. Hell, they actually introduce characters with the green screen just to then make them go back to just being in a house. They even lampshade it with a joke, which, all fairness, at least it's something, but it's still kind of them making an excuse not to use the green screen. The critics got it right. They must make their work their home and their home their work. Transform this place at once! But that would take hundreds of hours, and manpower we don't have. Nonsense! It can be accomplished in a simple George Lucas-style wipe. Observe. Wow! That was amazing! Indeed. I especially like the plant in the corner. Yes, it really ties the room together. Those cheap special effects now officially look like Adobe After Effects plugins instead of the cheap flash animations they were using before. There's still nothing that screams believable and actually makes certain stories from the document kind of hilarious. In fact, there's a lot about this one in particular that's pretty funny, but you already had the whole had to be told to have water story that went up in smoke because it wasn't true. So I'm not even sure if these are real, but fuck it. All you have to know is you had a lot of people say they could have done the special effects better when you watched their own videos and it was barely any better than what the movie actually had in it, so. Not really sure where the ego came from. In fact, to boldly flee in particular really has some stories latched into it that, frankly, make me question some things. And yes, I fully admit a lot of this is because of the previous lies, but I don't feel that's an unreasonable stance. They've already spread in some pretty major untruths in the document. What else could they possibly be lying about? It's a question you have to keep asking. The general production incompetence seems grounded enough. Complaining about the shoot schedule and the camera work affecting things, such as how the cameraman argued about how one scene broke the 180 rule, where you do shot reverse shot, it needs to be clear that the two are on opposite sides, and it can't look like one's at a different angle than what he's supposed to be if they were just facing each other. It makes sense considering these films ignored a lot of basic filmmaking rules before, but the one that people tend to bring up a lot is the rape scene. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. That's right, if you believe what everyone usually says about Channel Awesome, Doug put a rape scene in his movie. Except that's not exactly what happened. I mentioned before that Linkara's evil robot Double is involved in the plot. Well, he's actually one of the main antagonists. And his role in the story is that he starts assimilating members of Channel Awesome into being evil cyborgs. The first one he manages to get is Lindsay Ellis, who becomes a bad Seven of Nine parody. In the actual scene where he assimilates her, Film Brain walks by the door and assumes they're having sex. The Savage Chick, Linkara, you know, there's a meeting downstairs and. <laughs> 
I'm gonna give you two um Then leaving the room and spreading the rumor to everyone else. Young brain, you look like you heard two people having sex. How would you know? I'm French. We know. Notice that I said sex and not rape. Well, nothing in the scene itself points to rape, at all. For one, they're not having sex. Mechakara is turning Nostalgia Chick into a cyborg. The joke is that Film Brain assumes they're having sex, and nothing he says ever points to him thinking it was non-consensual. Now, funny enough, this is one of the claims where they actually went out of their way to include hard fucking proof. They posted a page from the script where the dialogue reinforces the misunderstanding. The document claims they were uncomfortable with the scene and Doug forced them to do it, but I call bullshit. Something about it takes the red flag alert in my head. For one, Linkara and Nostalgia Chick already have their own histories with edgy humor. Linkara with his... interests. Gay, dead, Muppet, gangbang. And Nostalgia Chick with the rape rap. So this situation feels a bit like weaponizing something they were comfortable with at the time, now that the social environment allows them to. Which is exactly what this entire document feels like at points. Keeping a mild story in the pocket, and tossing it out when they feel like there's something to gain from it. You are cool with seeing Doug Walker's panty shot in Suburban Nights, yet doing bad hentai dialogue from behind a door is too much for you? It's just not adding up especially considering Lankara's history with rape. Yeah, this dude has an unironic rape fetish. He once wrote a webcomic called The Lightbringer, where literally every other plot beat included rape, including one character who was an actress that was raped on stage while everyone thought it was just part of the performance. When I first came up with her, the idea was, in a nutshell, that she was an actress who was raped on stage in front of thousands of people who didn't realize she was being raped. Homie, that is literally just perfect blue. Also, his protagonist runs away from a rape, meaning we now know what Linkara would do in this situation. As stated, I actually believe a lot of the production stories behind the movies. It's just when something pops up that sounds a tad too over the top, you have to put on your detective hat and start asking questions. Like, now you people gave a shit about continuity and plot holes? You assholes ignored it all throughout Kick-Assy and Suburban Nights, but now is when you start bitching about that stuff? Of course I say that, but To Boldly Flee itself focuses really hard on plot structure, and I mean, as a theme of the movie, yeah, they go out of their way to make narrative continuity a theme of the film. The reality-warping anomaly is literally a giant plot hole in space, caused by something, and this is actually where I get confused. They keep bringing up a point where the death of Mati somehow create a plot hole that's now impacting things. But I honestly, for the life of me, do not understand what they're talking about. Like, everything in the last two movies were complete shitposts. You could rip these things to smithereens if you wanted to, but somehow this specific event caused a plot hole? They go out of their way to say it caused other plot holes, such as Spoonie turning into Doctor Insano when they're supposed to be different people. The answer is quite clear. We're dealing with... A plot hole. Well, you see, when Marty's ring collided with Malachi's hand, the resulting explosion ripped a hole in the space story arc continuum, thus filling the story arc with all these little pockets of chaos. Yes, it also explains why Spoonie could transform into me in Kigassia, even though we're obviously two completely different people. I still can't figure out if this was an actual plot hole to pay attention to, or if this is just a shitpost again. Cause half the goddamn plot relies on cartoon logic anyway, you really want to pull the plot hole card now? But what you might not know is that To Boldly Flee actually tries to be serious, and not in the Suburban Nights can dramatic death scene way. I mean you have full-blown scenes of Doug Walker in the midst of an existential crisis, talking about his purpose now he keeps hurting people to other characters. This is pretty funny in hindsight, but the thing is, this is actually a pretty major point in the movie. Nostalgia Critic's crisis affects him throughout the film, and the reason behind this is that Doug actually tried to kill off the character. Not even kidding, this was his attempt to end the Nostalgia Critic and move on to something else. His whole arc is about building up to a heroic sacrifice that allows his other critics to live on without him. Now, some people claim that he expected them all to retire alongside, but I don't really buy that, since the end of the film has them all celebrate together as Channel Awesome while Doug watches over them. 
This is going to be something I'll talk about towards the end, since this movie actually had some severe consequences for Channel Awesome. Now, to try and dissect the plot of To Boldly Flee sounds about as fun as getting a cancer diagnosis, so instead I'll keep things brief. Beginning of the film involves the critics slowly learning about the existence of the plot hole, while the feds and Hollywood executives hound them at every step, even going so far as kidnapping Spoonie due to Mati putting his character into Spoonie's mind. Yeah, full disclosure, while Mati is a major character in this film, he's not actually in this. He gets a mild cameo to retcon Suburban Nights, but he's not actually in To Boldly Flee beyond that. He was fired from Channel Awesome, and Rob Walker is just putting on an impression of Mati for all of his scenes. After they learn of the plot hole, they turn the critic's house into a starship after stealing Dr. Insano's technology, and set off towards the plot hole, hunted by Turl, who has teamed up with Zod from Superman and the Emperor from Star Wars, who is actually a lobbyist for Hollywood. You might already be getting sick of the references, but don't worry, it's gonna get worse. In fact, this is the major problem I kept talking about with To Boldly Flee's humor. Suburban Knights relied a little too hard on pop culture references, since the main joke is everyone dresses up as various pop culture figures, but To Boldly Flee doubles the fuck down. Not only do you get full characters who serve as references, but entire scenes that are just parodies of other movies, including an ass load of Star Wars bits. The whole house starship thing is meant to be one big Star Trek reference. There's even an extended Cowboy Bebop reference, with Jesu Otaku becoming Radical Edward after getting electrocuted. And this goes on... for a while. It's almost as bad as Mars Girl dressing up as Kusanagi, and Joe is Solid Snake, and Doug is Judge Dredd. If I listed off every reference in this movie, we'd be here for a while. More than once, it felt like a Seltzer Freeberg movie, just throwing references at the screen and hoping you laugh at that. In fact, the humor all around feels pretty lazy. I mean, it wasn't great in the others, but this especially feels like the jokes are more out of obligation than anything else. At least the other movies had bits that weren't just references. A complaint from the document is that literally everyone except Doug was miserable throughout the whole production. And honestly, I'm not too sure about that. There are certain people who at the very least seem like they were enjoying what they were doing. Angry Joe, as usual, has a lot of energy. Brad Jones gets to have an entire subplot dedicated to him becoming a Hollywood sellout and needing to be saved by Luke Mockery. Even if it is just a glorified Star Wars parody, it does take up a chunk of the runtime. No doubt it was a pain in the ass, but I just can't take these people at their word when they say shit like we had to film a four-hour movie in less than a week. Also, I do have to amend the Kickassia video real quick. That was not the incident with Applebee's, it was this movie. So right there, you have a lie. Since it was later revealed, Doug got them Subway to make up for the misunderstanding when everyone else went to Applebee's. They were even trying to claim one day had an 18 hour long shoot, and I'm sorry, but can there be any fucking proof about that? Cause that's shit that directly violates labor laws. It also apparently caused a huge argument over whether or not to film a green screen part. They filmed the ending after that shoot, and everyone only got 3 hours of sleep. Supposedly. After that, they decide to include a green screen segment, though Phelis says he could have just handled that at home and save everyone time. The document claims the Walker brothers agreed on the idea, but when everyone got to their hotels, they got a phone call, saying they needed Phelis to film the green screen part. It caused a huge argument, and Rob said fuck it and let everyone sleep. This is one of those over-the-top stories where I can't reasonably believe that these people were asked to do an 18-hour long shoot, and then immediately asked to film other scenes after only a few hours. That's something that you need to fucking prove, you can't just say it. Once again, so much dishonesty is already weaved into this, I can't just take you at your word. I just caught you trying to cheat at poker, you can't tell me to trust you when you say we should play Texas Hold'em. Because there's nothing that I detest more than the stench of lies. Was it a pain in the ass to film all this? No doubt, they all had to fly out to Chicago to be at Doug's place, film up to four hours worth of movie, which could theoretically be a massive amount of footage that was scrapped or not used, and then they had to work on all the special effects for a glorified shitpost video. Also, one of the claims is that the script implied everyone was retiring and it hurt their feelings. The same document where they accused the company of shielding a rapist, people. Back to the movie, the middle focuses on the critics traveling through space to the plot hole, with Film Brain investigating the truth behind it, while Brad Jones is corrupted into being a Hollywood sellout, while Luke is training to become a Jedi. Yeah, this guy is basically Obi-Wan and tries to train Luke in the ways of the plot. Just fuck you. It even gets to the point that Luke has to find a Yoda-type figure to train him further. Hi there! Wait! How did you do that? Nothing can stop me from my true calling of being a mentor. Yeah, but how did you get here? Jump cut! Well, technically, jump cut combined with parallel action. It's Feral Barry Stephen Sharp. Especially fuck you. Yeah, they really double down on the Star Wars shit. There's even a Death Star. They manage to rescue Spoonie from the feds, and Film Brain jumps into his mind to find out what's actually going on. 
Another thing to note, Filmbrain is noticeably more grounded than before. Suburban Knights in Kickassia, he was a mouth-breathing retard, but in To Boldly Flee, he's more put together. Still kind of an idiot, but not any worse than any of the other critics. Hell, he's actually one of the more capable ones who figures out the larger conspiracy. Now, the ending of the movie is where you go straight up the Nostalgia Critic's butthole. The critics infiltrate Turl and Zod's spaceship to sabotage it, while at the same time Luke tries to save Brad Jones, and the Nostalgia Critic abandons the group to confront the plot hole himself. There's also a very, very long montage sequence that does not matter. I'm not including it. I don't want to talk about it. It seems like the journey finally ends once Doug reaches the plot hole, except Mati was lying this entire time. The plot hole wasn't a solution. It was a trap. A trap to destroy the Nostalgia Critic. Mati wanted vengeance on Channel Awesome for never accepting him, and he plans on showing them that the Critic will abandon them all to save his own skin before the universe collapses. But as it turns out, the plot hole takes the Critic to the real world, where he meets... himself. Yeah, he actually talks to Doug Walker. Himself. And they talk about how the Critic character grew past his role as just a goofy comedy guy into his own entity. The plot hole is because Doug got writer's block for the ending of the film, and we're seeing the effects of that. So once again, what the fuck does this have to do with the ending of Suburban Nights? Since they reference over and over again that that's the star of the plot hole, it's why Mati is the one in the plot hole. But fuck it, I'm never getting answers here. While all this is happening, the real Linkara shows up in his spaceship and fights off the bad guys for everybody. Yeah, Linkara has his own spaceship, it's part of his lore and his videos, and... Once again, I'm gonna talk about this towards the end. Just know that I do not care. The critic is faced with a choice. Become a part of reality, or stay in his fictional world that's destined to collapse. At first, it seems like he's gonna screw everyone over and leave them to die, but the last second he decides to help his friends. He has no clue how to close the plot hole, but knows that it involves laying Mati's spirit to rest. He works with Film Brain and Bedent the Sage, in full Akira attire for a psychic battle, to persuade Mati to move on, finally letting go and leaving the plot hole. Unfortunately, this means there's nothing to stabilize it, so now it's threatening to tear the universe apart for good. It seems like all hope is lost, as once again they have no idea what they're doing. But then James Rolfe shows up to save the day, as he usually does. Turns out the secret to stopping the hole is to make it bigger. Point out how nothing makes sense across reality until the hole becomes so big it consumes everything. And Nostalgia Critic decides to personally fuse with the plot hole to keep the universe stable. So it's basically the ending of Persona 3, and Doug Walker is personally holding back humanity's desire for death. Praise be to him. Still, everything comes together for a happy ending. Brad regains his faith in cinema, Luke is on his way to becoming a true critic, Todd in the Shadows gets with Obscurus Lupa, and Film Brain gets to look out ahead towards these guys he never knew. To boldly flee is just not fun. On top of not being funny, it's actually really far up its own ass. There are so many scenes where they try to be deep, and it's actually exhausting. No, it goes beyond that. The scenes where they try to be funny end up being kind of pretentious. They take so many swipes at other directors like Michael Bay, and they keep talking about what makes a good movie and a bad movie, and in something like this, it can actually feel a little insulting. You can't go from bad bebop parodies to introspective discussions of purpose and the effects of cinema. I understand that Doug really wanted to make this a big deal. The finale for the Nostalgia Critic. It's all over the place in this movie, and it's actually to the point that it gave me a headache. Not all of it was his fault though, since everyone else is pretty much exactly as guilty as Doug, especially Linkara. You see, this movie includes a lot of his lore, his villains, his plot points. Linkara is literally the deus ex machina that shows up at the end to save everyone. And it's made even worse, because Linkara has his own movie. The guy that kept shit-talking Doug and talked about how unprofessional he is? Yeah, he made a movie that's canon to the larger Channel Awesome lore. And it's exactly as incompetent as all the other ones. Yeah, this shit's complicated and hurts my fucking head. Oh god. I'm gonna talk about Top the Fourth Wall movie as its own thing. Don't worry, guys. I mentioned before that one of the claims in the document was about how they were all afraid to boldly flee would make viewers think they were all retiring instead of just the nostalgia critic. And in all fairness, they did have a massive drop in viewership when Doug confirmed that the critic character was gone. When looking at the Google Trends, you see a sharp increase, all the way up until the end of 2012, where every related search term suddenly bottoms out, and that corresponds directly to the fourth anniversary video, To Boldly Flee, which, I kid you not, has a runtime of three and a half hours. Now, it's not the video itself that's so awful that's responsible for that decline, but what came at the end of the video, and the related follow-up that Doug himself put up, Okay, okay. Uh, the big question, obviously, on everybody's mind uh, after seeing that 
is, uh, is this it for the Nostalgia Critic? Is that it, uh, that we're not gonna do anymore, that I'm gonna hang up the coat, we're not gonna do any more weekly reviews? And the answer is, yes. Thing is, to boldly flee never once implies that the other characters were retiring too. In fact, the whole ending is that they're being protected by the critic, well, they're free to go on and keep doing whatever they want. It's much more likely that, well, the truth smacked them in the face. Very few of the Channel Awesome people had their own followings. They all just sort of latched onto Doug and the other big names for popularity. Also, this was 2012. YouTube was very much becoming its own thing, and an independent site like that guy with the glasses was forced to accept the truth. That blip TV is the way to go. That totally won't crash and burn. Yeah, it actually took these guys a while to accept that YouTube was going to be the ultimate winner, and they wound up wasting a lot of time and effort on platforms that only existed to shove a wooden stake up their ass sideways. But this brings me to the ultimate lesson of this journey. Channel Awesome was spurgy. They weren't very funny. They didn't have a lot of actual talents in them, and the ones they did have were fucking crazy. It was mismanaged. It wasted a lot of time and money on shit that didn't work out or didn't matter. But they're not evil. When the document came out, you'd think Channel Awesome was some horrible cult that had corpses buried in Doug's backyard. But that's just not true. Yeah, him and Rob were probably not great bosses. But that means they're just not great bosses. There's a difference between an incompetent leader and a malicious one. And these people worked with Channel Awesome for a number of years, able to make a living just filming dumb skits and reviewing cheesy movies on the internet. In the end, their complaints just seem so small, which I think is why you have so much of the over-the-top shit shoved in along with it. They knew outsiders wouldn't give two fists of a fuck about arguments over mid-roll ads, which also was exaggerated since apparently Lupa changed the story on three separate occasions. And this is the same person who said they were fired for being 15 minutes late instead of two hours, so grain of salt. Really, this whole thing feels really similar to the Helena Taylor Bane out of 3 controversy. Kicking up an emotional mob as hard as possible when really, the whole situation is something that outsiders never need to know about. It was all petty, small-scale complaints. It was all just people bitching about a job. When laid out in one big document, it looks like a big deal. The Juorio stuff was a big deal. But these people were still paid to sit on their ass and edit YouTube videos. And the one time they did have a legitimate shit show to handle, they fucked it all up. They covered it up or were trying to find ways to exploit it to their own end. Not once did anybody go, fuck this shit, I'm going back to tech support. They stuck it out until they were fired or couldn't survive the transition once that guy with the glasses and blip TV exploded. End of the day, they knew it was a sweet deal, something that anybody else would kill for. But they couldn't keep their shit together and fucked it all up. Were Doug, Rob, and Mike perfect? No, not by any means. But frankly, this document only made it substantially harder to piece together what they actually did do, since everyone decided to include so much bullshit. Hell, there are rumors that Lupa was badmouthing people on the set of the Atop the Fourth Wall movie, yet nobody brings that up in the document. You know, toxic work environment, that thing they harangued so much for and everything else. But it's probably because she helped write the document. She also showed up in two of Brad's movies after leaving Channel Awesome. So the Walker brothers were pure evil and need to be held to account, but you'll appear in one of their friends' movies with them as co-stars? Hell, Brad got fucking swatted by Change the Channel people, and a lot of people involved with that said, oh, he didn't actually get swatted, it was just a wellness check. Oh, uh, was got, yeah, there was a swatting and that was the day, the day of my funeral. dad's funeral. Uh, and, um, and when I texted the person that did this, kind of, they, uh, they, uh, said I was a liar, and so, mm -hmm. I just want to make that clear, so. He said that, huh? Wow, made that crap up too, huh? Okay, yeah, uh, screw him. Thanks for letting me know. Bye.
Even trying to say he was lying or worse, Brad Jones was a pedophile without any evidence. At the end of the day, it all just looks like melodramatic blustering by people that, frankly, I wouldn't trust with a fucking dollar bill. I mean, you also have the story of Mike Ellis apparently being such a massive sex pest that he both sexually harassed an morbidly obese dude and got to the point that one person in particular had to be protected with bats and a safe house and a fucking ninja sword instead of just going to the goddamn police. I can't take these people at their fucking word. Hell, I didn't even bring up how Spoonie was actually fired from Channel Awesome. He made a dumb rape joke to one of his fellow employees on Twitter and that was used against him for pretty much a month straight, being held over his head and even being brought up long after the controversy was over purely to dunk on him again. Now granted, yeah, it was a dumb joke, but they already had a whole series on Channel Awesome called Spooning with Spoonie, where the joke is he date raped various members of Channel Awesome. So once again, rape jokes are okay until they're not, until they are again. Basically, it's whoever's holding the leash, since at the end of the day, that's pretty much what caused the downfall of Channel Awesome. You had a click built within a niche click that wanted to run roughshod over everybody, pushing out the people they hated, protecting the people they liked, and all around basically just being the mean girls in high school, but for nerds. And if you mix this with the general incompetence of Channel Awesome, of course you can see why this whole thing fell apart in the end. Channel Awesome didn't fall apart because they were evil. Channel Awesome fell apart because everyone involved is fucking psychotic and desperate for each other's skulls. To climb the ladder by using anyone and everything to their advantage, and if they can't do that, cry foul and say the entire game is unfair. And you see that with how a lot of these people acted ever since leaving Channel Awesome. They simply can't let it go. Once again, mismanagement probably did happen. Doug was just some dude. But he was suddenly thrust into being the face of a company that represented a fair number of individuals. And of course, he can't handle every situation perfectly. But still, you guys have no idea how drastic this little gimmick has shifted as I've worked on it. I thought we could just poke fun at Channel Awesome and riff on the movies, but I'm not kidding when I say the document itself has eaten so much of my focus because there's just so much shit that's been allowed to spread, and people accept it as real because nobody brings up the flaws. And I think it's a mixture of not wanting to look like an asshole, somebody defending the big bad company against those poor downtrodden workers, who just add YouTube videos for a living, and also people who just plain don't give a shit. It's been so many years since any of this was relevant, and everybody's mostly forgotten about it. And when the document dropped, nobody had any reason to question otherwise. Sure, it was all claims, but the response given by Channel Awesome at the time was laughable bad, just basically saying sorry and dragging their feet on actually disproving anything. They did end up clarifying things, which kicked off the beginning of the end to the stupid movement, mainly through the Jawario name getting leaked, but it was too little too late, frankly. Everyone forgot and just let the issue die. Granted, it's not like this is some societal wrong that was never fixed. Doug Walker is still going strong with the Nostalgia Critic character. He tried to move on from it to make other stuff, but it blew up in his face. So he had to go back to the Critic character to earn the money that lets him experiment with other projects. Also, no, he did not use Pop Quiz Hotshot for a house payment. That was a story by Lord Cat, who once again was confirming any rumors that made Doug look stupid. There were a number of shows that were made with that Kickstarter money. You had stuff like Comics Awesome and shit like that. And of course, not every single show is going to get the budget it needs. It's going to fall apart. Pop Quiz Hotshot sucked, but it wasn't a scam. And regardless, everyone else has either faded into obscurity or they've become just as much of a laughing stock as Doug. And funny enough, his new crew actually defended him when Change the Channel happened. One of his actors, Malcolm, went out of his way to say he stands by Doug and views him as a friend. Brad Jones is still his friend. It's clear that this whole thing was a situation that never needed to be made public. It was disgruntled employees airing their grievances to their boss, but because they wanted to make it public, they had to make people care. So they tossed in downright petty and malicious stories, held off on details that are pretty fucking important, such as Lindsay Ellis not disclosing the full story about Dan Olsen and Holly covering for Jew Wario, and tried to paint the leads at Channel Awesome as a bunch of Saturday morning cartoon villains, all the while taking advantage of the people who did have legitimate complaints and exploiting them to give the document more credibility. That's all this was. And it's pretty funny that more than one of the figures that was intimately involved in the Channel Awesome document went on to try to cancel Vic Manana with Kick Vic, which also exploded into a massive shit show due to them constantly shoving in exaggerated details and lies in order to sell their story. These people love taking pot shots at everyone else, but when it's their time in the sun, they can't stand by it, and they always fuck things up. Doug, to his credit, just makes fucking movie reviews. He's not constantly looking for a back to stab. So, yeah. That's about all I can say. The wall review is stupid, but I mean, compare that to hiding actual predators, 
lying about every detail in the fucking document, exploiting people's goodwill in order to tear down your ex-boss and ruin his company out of a vendetta, was it really that big of a deal? One of the complaints from the document was that Mike Mashad called everyone troublemakers, and frankly, you all proved him right. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. They gave him a bat credit card? They had the balls to give one of the greatest superheroes of all time a bat credit card? <laughs>